morning, everyone. And uh, I guess everybody's got to shake the ice off and get warmed up. And that's, uh, I hopefully you're all toasty warm. Okay, I'm Joanne Coons and welcome to our workshop on green careers. A um, little bit about myself. I, I'm a adjunct professor at Hudson Valley Community College. I work at, um, I teach photovoltaics and design maintenance installation theory. Um, I'm on the New York Geo Advisory Board, and locally I am on my green committee for my town of Clifton Park here in New York. Um, so I advocate locally for um, renewables, et cetera. Um, okay, that's pretty much what I do, I guess. Um, I just, just wanted to start off our discussion kind of getting a handle on what is our basic need for um, workforce. And I'm going to be pulling off, and I try to get really current data. There's a lot of data out there, um, but our our state has um, been studying this, and they just produced a um, a 340-page scoping document on all things renewable, and included in that is workforce. So they have a, a monthly meeting, or I I think it's monthly for this climate council who is working on this document to um, put into action our CLCPA law. And um, they've concluded. The last session was on workforce development. So I listened to it. There were um, 125 pages on their slide presentation and it's just a lot to go through. So what I did is I tried to narrow down and I put together just a couple pages of, I thought some pretty interesting um, data. So Mike, if you could pull that up and share screen, that would be great. Um, so this is um, our welcome and next page, just is my source where I got this from. Oh, do I advance? Okay. Um, and so this was, uh, presented on the 20th. So right here is what we're going to look at to see that it is what is going to be displaced. This is like a clean disruption. And it really is going to hit hard on fueling stations. Um, and you can see petroleum is in yellow, vehicle maintenance, natural gas, nuclear, and other, which is a whole bunch of different things. Um, okay, so that is what those are the people that should be out there starting to look ahead to what can I get into and use my existing skills and maybe catch up on some new skills just so that we can, I can, you know, be employed in the future. Okay, so the next slide kind of shows where those jobs are going to be. Um, and so you can see that um, HVAC is, is big, um, the shell of, uh, in, of homes, insulation and efficiency. Commercial HVAC, offshore wind is a big piece of the pie, solar, um, and then there's other. So I thought this was um, pretty good research and you know it is New York State, but I think it can apply to a broader area of the whole Northeast. Um, this is the future. And it says draft, that's because there's a year for um, public comment and before they actually take action and put everything into place that they found. So it can be altered, but I think their research was good. So I wanted to share that with the group. So thanks, Mike, you can take that off now, but that's, um, that's kind of like the basis of why this is so important. There's a lot of retraining, there's a lot of new training, there's a lot of, we're in a transition and we need all people on board, all hands on deck from all different fields. So today we are really blessed to have a whole variety of people here to share their knowledge and experience on their different fields. Um, so I'm going to, the, the lineup is um, Matt, Devin, Josh, Gwen, Will, and Tim. And we're gonna start off with Matt and they're gonna introduce themselves, a little bit of a short bio and then what they see as far as um, how they got here. You know, I think a personal story is kind of interesting because we don't like, where do you start with this? How do you get there? That's probably the first thing. And how do I find my desire, follow my heart and get involved in what I'm going to be doing that's passionate about and successful and that you're happy and you're doing something good for the, 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 world, the earth, quite frankly. So Matt, if you'd like to start off and share a little bit about yourself and then kind of speak to those points, that'd be great. 
Sure, Joanne. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that nice intro. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Damaris. Uh, I was raised in Barry, Vermont, so I'm a Vermonter at heart, uh, though I, we now live in uh, Albany, New York. So I'm the owner and founder of a company called Energy Catalyst, which uh, currently is New York's only geothermal heat pump manufacturer. Uh, we make a heat pump that is specially designed for homes that have um, existing hydronic heating systems, meaning if you have radiators, baseboard, or radiant heat in your home, then we have a heat pump that is specially designed to um, convert that home to geothermal. Um, so kind of how I found my way into this field, it's it's a little bit of a, a long story, but I'll, I'll be really brief. So um, I, I felt like I had a really good education, um, both at um, Spalding High School, as well as I went on to Clarkson University, got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Um, and then I kind of worked through a couple of different energy related fields. Um, I had a short stint about two and a half years where I worked abroad in France, doing um, larger industrial heat pump applications. And then when I came back to the States, I sort of knew that I wanted to get into heat pumps. I wanted to do high efficiency, clean energy. And so um, one day I was walking around at a, um, it was like a trade fair. And I met somebody who said, Hey, you know, do you know how to install geothermal? And I said, yeah, I think so. I've never done it before, but I think I could do it. And he said, well, you should come and do my house. And so that was, that was um, now he's now my partner um, in the company, but um you know, Sam, it, he kind of helped be that initial startup for me. So he had a very, very difficult home to convert. Um, and by spending quite a long number of months doing a lot of estimation calculations, we, we were able to do it. It's been running comfortably now for over three years. Um, and what that kind of made me think about is, okay, this house was really difficult to convert. And I wonder if there's a better way of doing that. And I had always kind of had this idea in my head. And then when COVID hit, um, you know, I was just stuck in indoors for so long. And so I, that was the point where I said, I'm just going to just start thinking about this and start designing. And, uh, you know, about two years later now, roughly, um, you know, we have product that we're launching onto the market. So um, that's kind of how we, we came to be. Um, so it's definitely a really good time to enter the geothermal market. And one, one bold statement, I'll just say right up from the get-go, uh, you know, heat pumps, whether it's air source heat pumps or ground source like geothermal, they are the most efficient um, method of heating and cooling a home ever created by mankind. That's, I, you know, I challenge anybody to come up with a more efficient system. I mean, the, the heat pumps that we produce as a, for instance, uh, they operate between 350 and 600% efficient. So that's extremely, extremely efficient. And so it's no surprise that governments uh, all across the United States, even Canadians, um, you know, Quebec just signed a law. All of these government agencies, towns, they're using heat pumps as a solution for climate change. They want to use heat pumps as really their spear, if you will, um, to reduce carbon emissions uh, in their, you know, in their state or in their communities. And so as a result, there's a huge growing demand for heat pump installers. It is a little bit more specialized. And with that definitely comes a premium. So anyone considering getting into the heat pump industry as an installer, as an engineer, as a designer, even as a driller, um, all of those trades are in really, really, really high demand right now. I would say anyone who's a high schooler looking, you know, with, let's say, you know, kind of minimum skills, even they would be looking at an entry level, you know, hourly wage of maybe $25 an hour. And you can go up quite a lot. Um, the one of my the partners in my company, uh, he's only works for me part time, but he's quite specialized. And one of the best in his industry, he works on more commercial buildings, but he gets paid $125 an hour. Um, so, you know, there can be a very, very high ceiling um, in this in this industry. So it's a very high, high demand, high growth and generally very high paying 
uh, career. So I would encourage anybody to think, um, think about it. Um, yeah, so I see a couple of questions coming in. What's the best part of working in your area? I mean, honestly, for me, I just love, so I'm the kind of person that is heavily motivated by trying to create a better future, a better world that we want to live in. Um, so honestly, the best thing for me is just to, to go to a site and see that the product that we help to install and, and develop is working so well. And, you know, I love every time I'm there, I can't help myself. I'm always taking efficiency measurements. And, you know, the other day it was like, you know, 420% efficient on the coldest day of the, of the year. So I said, okay, we're doing really, really well. So that's, that's probably the most satisfying. Um, and then I think I'm running out of time, but just my one last piece of advice that I'd give to anybody, um, whether you're high school, college, or really any age, is to really try and understand the topic. Don't ever just try and memorize, you know, facts and data. Try and really dig deep and understand why something is the way it is. And challenge yourself and say, if it's, if I think I understand this, then what happened, you know, try and propose the opposite, right? To challenge yourself to that your real deep understanding. That that alone is how, you know, so basically my deep understanding of how heat exchangers and the refrigeration cycle work. Um, that's how we invented a heat pump, which is, you know, 25% better than everybody else's. And there's still so many people that work in the heat pump industry who, who all they know is they memorize things and that's all they know. They cannot follow why are why ours is so much more efficient because they don't have that deep deep understanding so that's my one piece of advice to anybody is you know try and really under understand exactly how it works and and don't give up until you you know it so with that i'll i'll i don't know if i went thank over under but no. thank good you. job okay so Devin's up and josh is on deck um that was a that was a great lead in Matt. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to actually touch on a couple of the similar things. Um, I'm Devin Karpak. Um, I'm the tech ed instructor at Otter Valley Union High School. Um, I've been teaching for about six years now. Um, three years. This is my third year at, at OV. Um, Otter Valley is in Brandon, Vermont. Uh, I live in Ripton. Um, so I believe one of your speakers in a few weeks also um, lives in this town. <laughs> just, just a little guy. Uh, um, but um, I came to teaching from a fairly uh, roundabout route. Um, I uh, have always been interested in engineering and technology and um, health overall. And in fact, I figured that uh, education, engineering, or something in healthcare would um, be where I ended up. And that kind of did a little bit of both or all. Um, I actually, uh, for several years, worked as a welder, um, actually in biomass for a while. Um, I built gasification plants. Um, I've built on the other side of that. I've built industrial dock systems and, and and awnings and worked on cars and things things along those route. Um, and I ended up uh, finishing my undergraduate degree at UVM. Thought about medical school. Thought about going back for engineering bunch of different things and through a succession of weird events um, I ended up teaching uh, welding actually uh, in northern Vermont for a few years um, then ended up teaching natural resources for a year and then this opportunity came up and it was a program that had been hanging out uh, for the better part of a decade with not much going on and um, Otter Valley is kind of interesting because it's it's in between Rutland where there's a tech center and Middlebury where there's a tech center so our kids don't get an opportunity to access those programs until their 11th grade year so seeing that gap um and knowing noting um so our so governor scott noted i think last week that there's 13,000 open jobs in vermont uh in a state with a population of just over 600,000 that's substantial um and knowing the, the, the move and the push to the green energy sector, that's where I've been focusing a lot of my time um, in terms of getting kids interested in, in uh, high paying, high growth fields. Uh, currently, we're in the second year of a, a program we call industrial tech, 
Uh, enrollment's been a little bit all over the place because of the pandemic uh, and, and recruiting, but uh, our project that we started last year was a tiny house and that curriculum very much is rooted in uh, the concept of, of minimizing your footprint, but also the skills to create something like that. And playing off of what Matt said, one of my favorite uh, ways to look at uh, craftsmanship actually is going deeply into something because you want to get it right. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really trying to convey. And yes, I did steal that from a book. Um, <laughs> I'm not that creative. Um, but the uh, um, concept of what I'm trying to do is get kids interested early. Um, because right now we're trying to retrain after first, second, or third career. And that's awesome. We're going to continue to do that. Um, but kids don't know what they want to do. I can't tell you how many kids I talk to every day and adults um, who are just like, well, I, I think I want to do this or I want to try that. And having explicit paths um, to connect them to those sectors is really important. And one of the things, because I have had that diverse background um, to be able to talk about you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist in anything. I actually was talking about to a, a, someone who works for Green Mountain Power yesterday and, about electric motors and realizing where my knowledge starts and where the gaps are, but I'm willing to ask the questions that creating that inquisitiveness of our, of our youth. Um, and as I said, showing them um, potentials in, in multiple industries uh, is, is my goal. And connecting with organizations like SolarFest and uh, local manufacturers and just trying to give them a realistic idea of this is how you get there. It might be college, it might be trade school, it might be an apprenticeship. All are valid, all are valuable, and it makes the world go round. Right. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good ending there. <laughs> no, that, that's great, Devin. Thank you so much for what you're doing for our youth because that's your planting seeds and that's so important. So that's wonderful. So thanks, that was great. Um, okay, so Josh is up and Gwen's on deck. Okay, Josh. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I've got some notes in front of me just to keep me from babbling because I will go on for hours. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders <laughs> of Cornus Technology. Um, I am also, uh, which is very exciting, the current acting chair of the EV and Autonomous Program over at Hudson Valley Community College. Uh, Cornus Technology is an EV-focused company that really acts as an internal uh, champion for businesses and communities to adopt electric vehicle ecosystems in the safest way possible. And this can look anywhere, like from reviewing architectural plans and design bids down to implementing and designing fleet programs, certifying staff and facilities for EV safety, which currently, if we're not the premier, we are one of the top companies that are really one of the only companies that's doing this um, in this emergency emerging field. And then we're, we're also creating and tailoring uh, different educational materials, such as curriculum and training webinars for different entities. Um, we've been very fortunate uh, in that we started February of last year. Um, and in this small amount of time, this industry is growing so much, we've been able to become one of the trusted experts in the field. That's why we've spoken at uh, the International Transportation Summit in Las Vegas on the future of infrastructure projects in this country. We've presented at the New York State Superintendents Conference, as well as spoken in front of the uh, New York Association for Pupil Transportation on how to plan for electric bus fleets. Um, so what am I doing in front of you? Why am I, why am I talking here? Um, I, somewhere in my mid twenties, I got the idea that working on cars was, was a good idea. So um, I was an English major. I thought it would be romantic. Uh, I went back to school. I got my associates at Hudson Valley uh, turned wrench for half a decade, switched over to the service side, being an advisor, and then eventually managing uh, two different dealerships in the area. I managed a Toyota shop and an, uh, and an Audi shop. Um, while in that industry, I would talk to district reps. I would look at what the OEMs were doing. I would reach out to as many industry people that I could about what was happening with these electric vehicles. And what were the plans for these different 
entities to, to deal with this incoming wave of technology. And the majority of the responses were, were for lack of better words, disappointing. Um, I tinker, I'm a Lego kid. So it's, it's how, how do we put this together? How do we solve these problems? Um, and my co-founder, who's got a background in wireless technologies, EV, large-scale battery deployments, we'd have these robust conversations and we found a lot of similarities in the different fields, you know, from the infrastructure all the way down to the vehicle. Um, so this was kind of born out of how do we, how do we participate in this? How do we, how do we help solve these issues? Um, this is this is absolutely the the best time to get into this field, um, and this is a massive field. You're you're looking is when you bring your car to the gas station right now. You know that. That oil came out of the ground, it went through some pipes, it probably went on a ship, it went on a truck, maybe a train, and eventually it finds itself at a, you know, the gas station. That's easy peasy. But for this, you have to figure, I have to run copper from where I'm gonna get my fuel, which is now electrons. Where, where does that come from? And you've gotta go all the way back to the generation, transmission, uh, distribution. It's, it's this whole complicated thing. And every single location, every business, every fleet is a snowflake. There isn't, you know, you, you just can't go to the store and buy the design plan for this. These have to be tailor made for you. And right now in the industry, the, the entities that you have to go to for this information primarily are the groups that are going to be selling you the products for this. So it's kind of like business 101, the last person that you want to go to to solve your problem, uh, that's who you have to go to. So we, we like to look at ourselves as this neutral third party that's kind of playing that role and helping design these things, mitigate risk in the safest way possible. Um, but once again, this is, this is that gold rush, wild west phase, a new and emerging technology. So it's extremely exciting. There's all these startups that are popping up. Um, locally in New York, I was just talking to some folks from Green Island EV. They're planning on having a, a you know, it's like a fantasy factory from what they describe. You're going to have, um, you know, building these vehicles. You're going to have training facilities. There's, there's people doing things all over the country right now. And collectively, we're participating in this experiment. Um, what, what does that look like? Um, you know, for, for people trying to get involved. Um, financially, it can be extremely lucrative. Um, from the infrastructure side, you're looking at electricians, um, you're looking at engineers. These are obviously, to begin with, they've, they've, they've historically been higher paying jobs, um, but now you get to specialize. Uh, so you get to increase your rates. And as uh, I was saying to somebody yesterday, you know, right now, since this is an emerging field, there's about like this many people that are experts that have high quality information. And the amount of work that we're gonna have is gonna do this. And when that happens, that expertise is gonna have to dilute itself to, to handle all these different projects. So one of two things is gonna happen. Either you're gonna have a bunch of projects that look terrible, um, and then those specialized people are going to have to come in and, and redo those projects, which ups the cost. Or we have sessions like this where we ideate and figure out how are we going to get the best information to everybody as quickly as possible so that we can disseminate good information to build this properly. Um, best advice, absolute best advice. Um, because there's so many different elements in this ecosystem, learn as much as you can. If, if I could go back 20 years, um, you know, I would still have gone through the automotive program. I think it's critical to understand vehicles. Um, then I'd probably become an electrician, um, maybe some engineering. Coding is a huge component. Everything needs software. Um, you know, the the sky's the limit with with this ecosystem that's that's emerging you 
it, it's so complicated and it's, I'm so excited by it. I think it's so much fun. Um, but really having, having the available critical thinking skills to work through issues, um, the curiosity to explore, and really, I mean, best advice you can ever give anybody ever is surround yourself with people that share an enthusiasm, that have existing knowledge that you can use, not just as somebody who's going to advise you, but somebody that's going to help you grow. Excellent. Totally agree. Great advice. Thanks, Josh. Um, very interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up more with the questions and answers later. Um, okay, so thanks so much. And Gwen is up with Will on deck. And um, Gwen, oh, there you are. Good yeah, good morning. I know our, our faces keep bouncing around as people join. Um, Good morning, everyone. Thanks for sharing this cold day uh, with us all. Um, it's really excited to be part of this panel. Um, I'm really enjoying hearing what everyone's adding to the table. Um, I'm the uh, founder and owner of BTF Residential Designs, um, BTF standing for Bite the Frost, which is pretty applicable today. Uh, <laughs> um, my company, it is, uh, we design net zero stock plans for the most part. and. It's a different version of stock plan, merging both architectural and mechanical designs into one drawing package to make building a net zero home easier on the contractor. Um, I think we've all started to see that cities and states across the country are requiring all residential new construction to meet the DOE net zero energy program as, as well as other programs um, as soon as 2030. So contractors, even in the residential sector, are going to need to be comfortable building to net zero design standards um, and high energy efficient homes. So our stock plan uh, puts it all together, makes it really easy for the contractor to just build right from that. Um, our plans are designed for construction in 35 different states right now. So um, you know, the HVAC is included, the, the energy, the solar, the architectural design, it's all in one. Um, it's pretty new. There's only one other company doing something similar and they're doing passive homes in Canada. So it's really something different. Um, and hopefully, you know, the contractors see the value in it. And I think they will as, as it's a requirement. Um, my path to get to launching this company, I started it in 2015 and my path uh, has been very non-traditional, which I recommend um, similar to what Josh was just saying, um, explore, do different things, whatever you're interested in, go for it. Um, I started out uh, going to Vermont Technical College. I just wanted a two-year degree in their architecture program. I was you know, set, I wanted to be an architect in high school. And as I did the program, I found out that architecture is really material management and, and learning different you know, building materials. And I wasn't as into that. And, and so I, um, I got the two-year degree and then I started working for a local lumber company and I worked in their estimating and design department. And most of our projects are residential and I really loved that. Um, but that it was really fun, but I decided, you know, I want to do something else, um, not just residential, but maybe commercial. And so I went back to Vermont Technical College for their four-year degree in construction practices and management. And um, while I was in school there, I worked at a, a local, uh, small local shop in their hardwares and home department. I was the, the head of the hardware department there. And then at this point, which is what I recommend to every young person, is I just started throwing out applications to really reach positions, like things I was not qualified for in any way, and do it. Everyone do it. Um, so Du Bois and King picked my name out of a hat and said, we're going to turn you into a mechanical engineer. And I was like, what? Uh, okay, let's do it. So um, I joined Du Bois and King with the sole knowledge of using AutoCAD. And today that's outdated. So young people learn Revit. If you want to be in this industry on the architecture or mechanical or, or plumbing or HVAC side of things, learn Revit. It is, and even contractors now use Revit. Um, so watch some YouTube videos. Um, at Du Bois and King, I was there for about seven years, and I started out as an MEP designer, which is mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, and uh, that was all commercial, absolutely commercial projects, um, and I found my interest was mostly mechanical, like HVAC mechanical, and so I was there for about seven years in the mechanical engineering department, and um, after that, I went to become a mechanical engineer for a mid-sized New England contractor, and um, 
yeah, of course, I love the construction. So, um, and then finally, after I was a mechanical engineer for them, I, I switched over to work for a solar distributor and design uh, solar systems for residential and commercial projects at the, uh, the piece by piece level. So mostly making proposals, but it's been, you know, it's good to learn too. Um, so that is my my chaotic background, which gave me the skill set to see there's a need for the construction side, the architecture side, and the mechanical side to merge together to create um, a plan set that does it all at once. So your contractor doesn't have to hire an engineering firm and then hire an architect and then you know hire hire a solar designer necessarily. It's all it's all at least started. So they can they can start right there out of the box one plan set. So um yeah i think a diverse background is really what helped me create the path i have and so go for it follow your interests uh don't be cookie cutter like if, you, if something looks cool it'll all tie together um and similar again to what josh was just saying um our development of energy efficiency across the board is going to rely on all different um branches of of jobs it's going to be you know, controls or programming or software, and it's going to be um, mechanical, you know, welding, it's going to be installation of ductwork, it's going to be heat pump design, it's going to be everywhere. So it's going to be almost hard not to find an energy efficient position, at least I hope. <laughs> I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> well, thank you, Gwen. I'm telling you um, that I, I like your story, because it shows that you, you really don't get what you need in a conventional higher education setting. It's stale. You know, it's prescribed. It's like square pegs, round holes. It's just, and what you did was fantastic. And all of you, because you found your way and, you, and you know, you're focused and educated and dedicated. And I think maybe using some self-discipline to really keep to the, to the goal which is a work ethic thing. So that's, that's really cool. Um, I think it's a great story, it's all of yours. It's, it's so inspiring. And uh, I really appreciate you all sharing. So Will, you are on. And um, last but not least, Tim will be on deck for his, his story. And Will Solar, and I, get, I haven't really been mentioning this, um, Tim is going to be on energy efficiency. So that's the topic. Okay, so Will. Take it away. Hey, thanks. So my name is Will White. I'm the Director of Business Development at Solar Energy International. We're a nonprofit that provides training in the solar industry. And uh, speaking of you know, wandering paths to get to where you're at, um, I actually have a degree in music business management. Um, moved to Arizona and um, get interested in natural building. And I'm originally from Rhode Island, had moved back to Rhode Island and Back in 2004, 2005, you know, natural building wasn't a thing in Rhode Island. Um, so I got connected with a guy who uh, was doing energy efficient homes and had just cold called him and said, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. You know, I'm interested in natural building and, you know, looking for a, a new job and a, a kind of a new industry. And he said, well, our energy efficient building is we're phasing that business out because my solar business is doing so well. I said, but hey, I'm, I'm interested in solar. You know, I've, I've done some kind of mechanically construction-y kind of stuff. And he said, well, come on down. And that was in 2005. I, I started out as a, an installer, just uh, putting modules on the roof and doing electrical work and just jumped around to all different positions in the industry. I did sales for a little while and really got into operations maintenance, um, uh, operations management. Um, in managing crews, uh, managing regions. And uh, then about five years ago, I, I left that company um, after almost 11 years and joined Solar Energy International doing curriculum development, uh, teaching solar, and uh, recently moved into a business development role, um, selling our, our courses to um, companies that are interested in training for their uh, employees. So uh, yeah, very kind of a wandering route through the industry. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of different jobs in, in the field. It's kind of a, an interesting and diverse industry from everything from the, the operations mechanical where you, you don't need really any experience. They'll train you on the job. Um, you can obviously take classes from organizations like uh, SEI 
um, to licensed electricians that are a huge part of our industry. But then it goes into other things like uh, design, where we have uh, electrical and mechanical engineering, uh, sales, marketing, procurement, um, HR, um, lots of, uh, when you get on the commercial side, more business development, um, land use, and um, securing land leases for utility scale projects. Um, so lots of different things there. And you know, one thing I really appreciate about the solar industry is the ability for um, people who don't necessarily have an educational background uh, can get into an industry easily and really make a, a livable wage right off the bat. Um, solar installers on the operation side who are coming uh, into the industry with maybe a, a little construction background, but really no solar experience, um, can I expect to make anywhere from probably $15 an hour uh, and higher. Um, there's so much demand in the solar industry at this point. It's, it's, really, um, it's, it's really amazing. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, we kind of joke at SEI that the bar to get a job as a solar installer at this point is a uh, show up. Um, that's kind of the, the, the uh, you know, where we're at at this point in the industry. And, you know, don't be a drug addict helps too. But, um, you know, there's really a, a lot of on-the-job training. So a lot of opportunity there. And uh, kind of like Josh said, the, the solar industry, in order to meet the climate change goals that we, we need to achieve, the industry has to grow just by multitudes. So, Lots of opportunities now, and there will be continue to be lots of opportunities. And um, you know, for motivated individuals, there's a lot of opportunity for advancement as well. Um, you know, I started out as a wrench turner, solar installer, and ended up as director of construction, uh, managing a, a team of about 50 people and about uh, three million dollars a year in uh, revenue generation. So, um, lots of opportunity there. And. Um, you know, best advice if, if you're interested in going into the operations side, uh, much like Josh said, uh, one thing I always wished I had done is gone the licensed electrician route. Um, that opens up so many opportunities and many companies will um, subsidize uh, that track. So you can get in as an apprentice, they'll get you into the apprentice classes and pay for that and pay for all the tests that you need to take that um, to get that license. But having that electrical license and um, a little uh, tip here for those of us in New England, um, if you are in the, uh, an area close to New Hampshire, uh, I strongly recommend getting your electrical license in New Hampshire. Um, they have uh, reciprocity to a lot of the other New England states. So with a New Hampshire electrical license, you can get uh, reciprocal licenses in, in many other states like uh, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, um, without having to take a test just by paying the fee. So a great, great option option there. But yeah, lots, lots of potential in the industry. Uh, the, the licensed electricians, the demand for, for them is just incredible. Um, I was running operations five, six years ago, and, and, and then we were having our electricians, um, journeyman electricians, getting job offers from other companies for forty dollars an hour with you know two thousand dollars sign-on bonuses, and uh, it's got gotten even um, more competitive since then. So, lots of opportunities there, and, but there's a lot of other opportunities in the industry other than just operations, um, design, and sales, things like that. So lots of different choices in the solar industry and it's a, an industry that's growing by, by leaps and bounds. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you made some good points about, you know, you think about solar, like, and any, this really applies to any of the fields that we're discussing today. There's always a need for a whole bunch of supports like marketing. I was just thinking if you're a writer, you could actually write manuals and, you know, read the, read the manual. And I mean, there's so many layers of support that goes into each and every one of these fields. So, you know, there's not just, there's niches, let's just say. And um, if you say, oh, I don't really like solar. I, mean, I don't want to go out there in the cold and, you know, but, but if you want to support solar and that's something you have an interest in, there's other ways to support it through, you know, marketing and such, but um, Okay, I didn't mean to take up somebody else's time like Tim, yes. but yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Will, that was great. And I really enjoyed your story. <laughs> These pathways to where you get to is really interesting, I find. <laughs> okay, Tim, would you like to pick up from there? And Sure thing, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> yeah, it's been great hearing 
everybody's stories of how they got to where they are. <laughs> life, life is quite an adventure. Um, I'm Tim Yandow, and I work for uh, Efficiency Vermont, uh, which I think many of you are probably familiar with. We're a energy efficiency utility, which basically means we're we're a regulated utility, just like Green Mountain Power, except we generate power by by saving energy, um, basically. And I've I've been here for a grand total of about 13 months, <laughs> so I'm I'm fairly new to Efficiency Vermont. Um, and uh, if if you connect all the dots, I started. I was a, a, a pre-vet uh, student at UVM. Uh, and of course, you know, it's totally logical, like going from there into, uh, right now I'm, I'm a program manager uh, at Efficiency Vermont uh, in the residential uh, portfolio department. And I'm particularly focused on providing services to uh, those, uh, the low income community. Um, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. Anyway, yes, I have a, a kind of a, a, a long and winding road to how I got here too. Um, but uh, as I as I got into my undergraduate, I got very interested in and realized I really wasn't destined for medicine, um, but field biology. Uh, I got very interested in an in, um, ecosystem uh, ecosystem dynamics. So I ended up getting a degree in the biological sciences and field biology and went to work for uh, a, a little obscure uh, organization called the Ecosystem Center, which is part of the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole. And this was way back in, in the early 1980s, and they were already doing research in uh, around issues around climate change. People were been talking about this since the 70s. Um, and it was a real education for me to start getting involved with, um, with all these folks. And what I did was we had a research site way up in Northern Alaska where we established uh, uh, and defined a research site that was uh, meant to be monitored over many, many years to, to watch and see how these ecosystems changed over time as the climate changed. Um, and as far as I know, those sites are still being monitored um, up there. Um, and uh, from there, um, I had uh, went to the University of New Hampshire uh, and started a PhD program in, in uh, forest biology, um, but <clears throat> ended up dealing with some some health issues. So being the very curious person that I am and always trying to reverse engineer things, I got very involved in natural medicine um, to try to figure out what was going on with me. And, and that actually led to a, uh, uh, a small practice that I had for years, uh, helping other people get well, um, utilizing uh, all kinds of different things in natural medicine. Um, and during that time, um, because my grandfather was a carpenter and a builder. Um, I also kind of filled in my income by doing uh, small carpentry jobs um, for people. And that eventually uh, led me into a, uh, an opportunity uh, where some friends of, of mine had a falling out with, a, with their contractor and asked me to build their house. And I had never built a house before, but being someone who loves to build things and tinker with things, I was like, sure. So I pulled together a crew and off we went. And I decided very early on when I got involved in building that I didn't want to add to the problem of climate change. And everything that I built, I was going to build in a way that was going to be part of the solution. And that was a very conscious choice that I made. Um, and <clears throat> over the years, I developed a, a small residential building company uh, called Yandao Green Builders. I had uh, six guys. Uh, on my on my staff, and we just got involved in all kinds of great projects. Um, every almost every single one of our homes that we built uh, was a uh, uh, high performance or net zero. Um, some of them are actually little generation factories where they're actually 
uh, producing more energy than they're using. Um, and I did that uh, for, I don't know, maybe 12, 12 13 years. Uh, I was involved with my little construction company. And, um, and then uh, during that time, I was very involved with Efficiency Vermont. They were doing um, uh, third party uh, commissioning for me for our ventilation, our, our HVAC systems. Um, and I was also involved in their home certification programs and their incentive programs and took advantage of, of the programs that they had in place and got to know quite a few people there and really liked what they were doing. And sort of off in the corner of my mind, I was thinking, geez, these folks might be really fun to work for someday. Um, um, and then in uh, 2014, uh, one of the folks that I worked with from Efficiency Vermont had informed me um, that uh, Champlain Valley Weatherization Service, which is one of Vermont's weatherization assistance programs, was looking for an associate director. Um, they really needed somebody to help uh, assist the director in running that program. And at that time, I was really looking to do something a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> although my work was uh, in construction was really fun and really interesting, it was also very stressful, as those of you who run your own business know. <clears throat> it's 24-7. If you're not actually working, you're thinking about working, and it's very hard to unplug from that. Um, and so I decided that I would move on to something else. I was hired as the associate director um, at, at the Weatherization Assistance Program at uh, uh, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, and off I went. So I was there from 2014 until recently. Um, and I was obviously that's a program that is there uh, that's focused on energy efficiency, but also really climate justice issues. So there's a big gap here, which I think people really need to keep in mind. All these great technologies, all these wonderful jobs that are out there to not forget the fact that these are, are not necessarily as accessible to everybody as they are to other folks. Um, so that's one of the things we were trying to remedy through the through the weatherization assistance program is to make sure that people of lesser means are not left behind um, in the energy efficiency um, divide. Um, so at, at uh, Champlain Valley Weatherization, one of the things that I did was I worked directly with Efficiency Vermont. We had a contract with them providing electrical energy efficiency services to low income Vermonters. And which is what I'm doing now on the other end, I'm actually the program manager for that. So I worked with all the weatherization assistance programs throughout the state. Um, so I developed this great network of relationships with people. So when I moved into this position, uh, it was just a very easy fit. Um, and I also oversee their residential new construction program. So from my construction background, uh, that was also a really good fit. And so I'm also really involved in trying to push the envelope on the standards of energy efficiency um, construction in Vermont, um, the whole team of us. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so that's that's kind of how I got here. And and if if I could provide one little piece of advice, like other people have said, is be curious, talk to people if you're interested in things, talk to people who are already doing it, who are passionate about it, uh, do things that are meaningful and interesting and purposeful to you, uh, and uh, there are there's never been a time I, that I can know of in my lifetime where so many opportunities are open right now. We have some big problems to solve um, and we need everybody, you know, all hands on deck to, to solve that. So anyway, thank you for the time and I wish you all really well and, and whatever adventure you end up embarking on, go for it. Thanks, Tim. I was putting my thumbs up because you said you're pushing the envelope. And I'm like, I'm so glad somebody's out there pushing the envelope. I didn't mean to cut you short. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was like bye, I was bye. getting excited about what you were saying. <laughs> That's great. Um, first off, I want to say nobody looks old enough on the panel to be taking so many different career pathways to get to where you're going now. It's like, how, you all, it doesn't seem possible, really. It's, it's kind of interesting. I Maybe by your, it keeps you youthful by exploring and, and following your heart into the next best thing to do that's gonna help you and the planet. So that's, that might be the a remedy here. It keeps us youthful. Um, also, I, I kind of hear an underlying um, 
theme here that says, you know, say yes when opportunity is approaching you. It might mean a life change, but saying yes to those opportunities can lead you into new avenues that will really, um, I don't know, lead to something that's that's really useful and helpful. And you can always go back. Um, you can always build the plane once you jump off the cliff. That's a good way to put it. I like that. That's that's exactly what I mean. Um, okay, I had a couple questions here. We have some general questions. So this is our question and answer se segment. Um, I'm going to ask um, a couple that came up on the chat. How can we understand which of our, oh, I wrote my, our current skills are transferable? If anybody just jump in and answer it. Um, you know, like what do we have that we can apply and to something else? Go ahead, Devin. So, so this, this is uh, where I spend most of my time. Um, and I think this is uh, echoing what Will said is show up. Um, that's where we're struggling right now. Um, that's especially in the youth and the, those people who are um, either coming back into the workforce or we're, we're struggling to retain people. Um, showing up and, and being on time, we call, you'll hear them refer to as soft skills, transferable skills. Um, it's not anything specific. It's it, in terms of like industry specific. It's not like, oh, you wire the black wire um, in residential first here, you do it this way. Um, it, it's not that stuff. It's showing up, being able to take instruction, being curious and listen, listening. I know it sounds really basic, but as I said, that that's the stuff I'm struggling with every day with a lot of my kids is, and, and these things. Um, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer in some way, but it's... No, I think you, you really raise a really good point because, I mean, I, I'm in education as well and showing up, at, I, I, I think those types of skills need to be incorporated in all training. Um, and spreadsheets. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, Tesla has, um, when they hire, they, they put people in three groups. And the first group, they teach them how to wire um, an outlet box. The next group, they teach them how to put in a racking system on a solar for solar panel. The third is a personal interview. So then they say, okay, we taught you how to do that outlet box, go ahead. And the whole group, the first person stands up, picks up a screwdriver and tries to do it. Doesn't mean they know how to do it. They get hired. And that is the way they do their hiring. Um, it's the willingness to learn or to try. So that is a very important skill and that's how they screen for that. And I tell that story to all my students to explain to them that if you want a good job, you gotta have, you know, it might not have all the knowledge and stuff, but that will follow. You need to have certain ethics and basic skills and work, you know, willingness to work skills, knowing about tools. And so anyhow, when we are designing courses, those are the things we need to address as well. It's not just the other skills that, you know, hands-on stuff. So that's sure. a really, that, sure. if I can anybody add else? I, I'm sure every one of the panelists up here, but certainly myself included, can tell you a, a dozen or more horror stories where they tried and failed miserably, right? Um, and so I think that's, a, that's another thing. If you don't even try, then you're never going to make it. Um, like I can say within, with, total certainty that I tried at least 20 or 30 different designs before we had anything that looked any, you know, good at all um, with our product. So, you know, and, and also, you know, there was a couple of big, pretty, you know, embarrassing stories of when we first started doing installations, but we, we were out there, we're trying. And now that we learned it, we, you know, our, it, I guess the, the goal is not to make the same mistake too many times. Right. So, but yeah, totally echo that, that sentiment. All right. I'd love to if, tie it back to, yeah, go for it. <laughs> oh, I, was, I know, it's, it's, we all want to talk. Um, two things very quickly. Um, one, because this is this new field right now, um, there's an advantage to people not having a traditional background in a lot of these things because nobody really has them. Um, I can't tell you how many C-level executives I've spoken to at, you know, these electric EV companies that have no background in it. Um, a lot of people are marketing and sales, um, business management. So 
once again, that curiosity, that willingness to, to try something, um, now's the opportunity where you can actually get in. And the other thing is, once again, like this, we're all saying the same thing. You, we're all here because we not just were able to find avenues to get us to this place, but there was a, a desire to learn independently. And everybody really needs to, unfortunately, you can piecemeal this together, but it, you have to learn independently unto yourself. Um, we're going to have, I think, in quarter two of this year, like a general ed 101 on kind of all of this to try and give people that, that general knowledge, um, you know, in the best, most consumable way possible so we can try and get this thing going. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is a, an exciting time. There's nothing to be really like discouraged. It, it's, you know, if you want it, go for it. Yeah, that's exactly like, it's a, it's a, a moment of innovation in this industry on all different fronts. So back to the question, I, I think a little bit, you have no idea what's going to be relevant. Like things that I learned in geometry in like seventh grade, I had no idea are going to be entirely <laughs> relevant when it comes to energy modeling and general design parameters. Like it all, it all ties together. And I think as Devin just said, learn Excel. Excel is a workhorse of amazingness. <laughs> Circles and triangles. <laughs> Devin, I did want to speak to your point about the phone and how it's your, your enemy, kind of. But there are certain classes that I know my, my students take, not mine, of course, that they might be learning more on their phone than they do from their professor or their book, textbook. And so actually it's a tool for them to learn on their own, that independent learning thing with YouTubes or whatever, if that's what they're doing. Now, a lot of them are not, and I understand that, but um, yeah, I don't know how to differentiate between the two, but there, it can be a tool. And I, I, I just put that out there to my students and explain it to them that way. And, you know, hey, you're, you want to go play games all day? Well, guess what? That's, you know, that's the kind of life you're going to have. It's life choices. I call it natural selection. <laughs> I think as you mentioned earlier, discipline is probably what got us all to where we are now uh, in some extent. And don't be afraid. Like I often will get distracted by our lovely tools, but you know, I've installed apps over the years that say, you know, after 15 minutes, I can't be on this social mm -hmm. media platform anymore or things like that. And don't be afraid to use tools to try to break your bad habits. Yeah. Discipline's a big one. And no one's perfect. We always break discipline as well. So just try your best. <laughs> it's hard. It's a hard balance. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but I, I know what Devin means. It's just really some, some people get it. Some people don't. It's unfortunate. And, uh, you know, upbringing has a lot to do with things here. Social, economic um, backgrounds. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't know what happened at a kid's home when they are or anybody's home when they came to work the next day and, and what they're experiencing. And then you expect the same out of them as somebody else when they have a lot on their mind. Um, I do try to be cognizant of people's situations whenever I'm speaking to them, even you know in a grocery market or at any level. Um, I did want to say, I, if I can put my two cents in about, um, and I, I like how Tim addressed the socioeconomic thing and, and reaching out to underserved communities. I like community solar and solar in general because it's like you turn on your light switch and you're getting energy from who knows where. Well, from now on, it's going to be solar and wind primarily. And I hope that uh, our HVAC systems become that way. You know, you turn on your heat and you're going to get clean energy from a district loop of a geothermal system that comes to your house. You don't have to drill your own individual well. And so it's, it's, we're actually doing this right now. We don't make, we don't really have these choices. We just, flick a switch, pay a bill, and, and we have heat and light. But what has to transition is our sources. And that's the exciting part here that we are getting into our renewables to provide those sources. And people don't have to make those individual decisions. The utilities are making these decisions for them. The um, energy efficiency is another story because that is each building individually has to take that responsibility to do that if they're not new construction. And that's probably a little bit more difficult, I would say. Um, and, and policy 
and you know that's another avenue we haven't really talked about if people want to go into renewables there's a whole broad field of advocacy and legal and you know setting policy so that's kind of an that's a niche too that that could be um you know lobbying i guess lobbyists get paid no no um, okay, another question came in that was, is it better to work at a dedicated clean energy company or to join a traditional business to looking when that's looking to expand? Yeah, I can, I'll start with that one. Uh, you know, it kind of depends. Um, solar has moved beyond the kind of, uh, you know, people getting into it from, you know, a, a kind of ancillary uh, industries into a legitimate, you know, profession. And if you've got the ability to learn quickly and develop systems well, you can, you know, take a traditional company and move it into the industry. But um, I would say in most cases, it's best to start with it. The company already doing it knows how to do things right. Um, I can't tell you the times I've seen electricians who've been you know, in the industry for 20 years come into solar and me, the unlicensed guy, have to go back and fix their work. <laughs> um, so, that, I mean, that's that, that's my opinion. You know, it also depends on the market, too. Here in New England, uh, for solar, at least, the market's pretty saturated, especially in Vermont. There's a lot of solar companies, so there's a lot of competitions. If you're in markets that are more new, say like the Dakotas or Montana, you know, places where there's not a huge industry, then it's a great time to, to transition in as a, as a, from a different, um, a different company or a different kind of point of view. I really like what you said with starting with a, an energy efficient company, learning the right way to do it, because I think that's a really big thing. Um, in my mechanical engineering days, which were in entirely commercial construction, um, that was a little bit what you were saying earlier, Joan. It's, it's kind of frustrating because you, you get this commercial building owner and they say, you know, design it energy efficient as best you can. And then it gets to the construction phase and there's this value engineering, which is basically cut the costs and let's just like trim it all down to bare bones as much as we can. And mechanical gets hit first. And I was heartbroken every time we had a great, you know, great system. And then it just became less and less efficient because they were trying to save money on building. And so if you want to make a difference, you could work in a, you know, a, a setting that isn't energy minded, but you can really make a difference there because you can argue for what is energy efficient to a group of people who might not know, but having the skills first where you've learned it the right way and know what is efficient is really important to do that. So I think both have their highlights. It's what you're comfortable, you know, working on and fighting for, for sure. <laughs> I think the other thing is, is like getting into something is using a micro credential or, or a credential as a springboard. Um, I know in Vermont, VSAC, uh, at least previously, I don't know, currently offers about a $1,200 uh, non-degree retraining um, grant. So if there's something that's like intro to solar or solar technician or heat pump installer, um, even if it, it's really focused, it's a it's normally a um, uh, a concerted class that says, you know, we meet three Tuesdays and for four hours every Tuesday and you're done. I, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but um, that's a good way to springboard. And also you can go either way with that. It can be an add-on to get into a non-conventional company to start the change for them or directly into a, into a company that is um, more focused. If I could just put my two cents in from what I've observed, I've not experienced, starting your own company type thing is almost like a solar integrator. You have to be understand permitting, you have to understand installation, you have to understand design, you have to understand operation and maintenance, you have to understand marketing, you have to understand, there's just like, oh, how do they do it all? And it's really, really difficult. Um, so getting little bits and pieces wherever you go. And I also wanted to say like an HVAC installer comes in to a person's house and their gas heat, heater is broken. And so they're the first person to person contact 
face to face with a homeowner. And if they don't have the knowledge and skill of how to recommend maybe, you know, this would be a good time if you took a look at a non-fossil fuel alternative, there could make a big impact. And I think that education is also important for existing um, people that are practicing these different renewables or different, not renewables, or different um, fields so that when they do have that contact, because they really are influential, they can make a difference too. That's not happening at all that I can see. And it's, it's really unfortunate because every time you install a new system, it's another 20, 25 years of fossil fuel burning. So it's really, I think that's really imperative. Um, okay. Um, yep. I wanted to just say one other thing, uh, Joanne, really quickly. Um, just, to, you know, to people who are out also looking, looking for work and exploring all these different job opportunities, also take the time to get to know the people you might be working with. Um, you know, what's their background, what's, you know, what's their approach, their attitude. And, and I, I think about uh, one of the guys on our weatherization team who, who uh, you know, we spent a lot of time really developing a work culture where people felt supported and welcomed. And it's hard work. I mean, weatherization work is brutal, um, you know, particularly when you're crawling around underneath, you know, mobile homes and in attic spaces and crawl spaces. And so we really made a point to really support our people. And this person went on to work for another company because they could make more money. And they realized afterwards they made a big mistake because of the culture of the company. Um, they didn't take the time to get to know who they were going to be working with. And we spent a lot of time with the people we work with. So I just wanted to chime in on that. Uh, and I, I don't think people can just walk into jobs out of college and be an instant success. There's stepping stones to get to where you're going. And I don't think that's been, I don't know, mentioned enough to people. They, they think that it's a magic. They get this degree and magic is going to happen. Well, it, it's, it's starting to hit, reality starting to hit that that's just not the case. And uh, I think that's why we're starting to see more people take a, consider a, a serious look at, at the, uh, the trades more, which I hope, because it's a it's an excellent field to get into. Um, very respectable, and I, I'm I'm just blown away by the knowledge people have in these fields. I think it's great. Um, I did have a couple questions specifically for like Gwen. You you let off that you do stock plans. Now I know what that is. I'm not sure everybody does. So I thought maybe you'd take an opportunity just to explain what a stock plan is because we're going to be sure. reaching all sorts of audiences here, and I want to make sure that they're comfortable with understanding that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so like when you go to like uh, floorplans.com or, or houses.whatever, um, you can buy like that would be called a stock plan. And um, that was actually uh, very early on in my career, back to that very first question, when you don't know what you're learning is going to become relevant 10 years later. Um, I noticed working for the lumber company that people would spend thousands of dollars on these stock plans and they'd say, you know, we bought a piece of property, we want to build this plan on it, and they'd bring it into us, and they'd say, how much would this cost? And an extremely large majority of the time, they would spend thousands of dollars on these plans and the roof lines were impossible to build, the stairways didn't line up, they were absolutely monstrous, like <laughs> nobody lives in a house this size. Um, and they certainly weren't designed for a climate that sees snow, which we obviously see in New England and Vermont, um, which is where I am. So there was that huge gap right there immediately that that plans in general, stock plans aren't necessarily great. And then, you know, 10 years later, I realized, you know, we're also going to need energy efficiency and a lot of contractors might not yet have learned the skills of how to do that right. And so this is, you know, a design to make it easy for them. Um, so that is the, the stock plan, I guess. It's, you know, a drawing package of blueprints that, that say how to build it and what in systems you can install. And it comes with the energy modeling and the solar design. And, and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. <laughs> Thousands of hours. So with a stock plan, you don't have to start at zero. It's pretty much done for you. Right, right. Which is actually beneficial. For a lot of people yeah yes especially like a like a you know a neighborhood where you see like five or six of the same home or you know a contractor who wants to build a spec house um those are particularly places where stock plans i think are purchased um and also you know the homeowners who, who see something online that they really like and think i could live in there um 
those I think where stock plants come in because not everybody can afford to hire an architect for a custom design. It's a lot of money. Um, and yeah, that look back to kind of like Tim with your affordable housing, most people can't afford to hire an architect for a custom home. Um, so stock plans. <laughs> That's good. No, and, and the other question I had for Tim was he was talking about um, third party verification. And again, I do know what that is, but I'm not sure everybody understands that when you put in some of these things, you have to verify and that's what it, I think it is, but maybe you could explain it better. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, there's all, all different types of third party verification. So there's like the lead program. Um, there's the, uh, it's the Green Building Alliance uh, certifications. Um, and uh, like Efficiency Vermont has, uh, they have a home certification build spec standard. So the idea is you build your house to a certain uh, energy efficiency spec. So it includes, you know, the, the thermal elements, the electrical energy efficiency, um, you know, energy star appliances, et cetera, and so forth. So what a third party uh, verifier will do, will go into the building and, and say, yes, all this stuff is there and it actually happened and then provide this third party uh, trusted verification that indeed your home met all these standards and they provide the certification for the home rather than, you know, self-certifying and saying, well, yeah, I did all this, not necessarily having any way to verify that it happened. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it does cost money though to have these third, it adds a little layer of, of finance to the whole project, doesn't it? It, it, it does, but um, it's interesting. Uh, I just took part in a, um, a webinar the other day from the Canadian Home Builders Association. They do this big annual survey. Um, and one of the things that they're, this very large survey that they did of, of home buyers uh, found is that third party certification is a very valued uh, uh, element to homes. I and mean, it's something that home buyers actually look for um, when they're either, either buying a home or hiring a builder. Is this someone who, who is you know has you know won awards for their certified buildings or or you know has property uh you know building projects that they've done before that are that are certified you know under one of the various you know certification programs so homeowners actually value that because they like to know what it is that they're buying i was hoping when somebody passes a bill or makes policy that when they sell a house it's rated for energy efficiency as an ABC. I believe that's done in New York City yep. and they post yep. it right as you walk in. It has made a big difference because yep. who wants to buy a D house. So it yep. incentivizes people to keep up with these things and automatically, you know, you're going to see the benefits in the resale and yep. it, it in, would make sense. There yeah. is a home, uh, home uh, energy labeling um, program that's been in the works for years in Vermont. Um, it's being implemented in the city of Montpelier uh, right now as a requirement for um, new uh, existing residential homes that are um, going on the market. Okay. Um, so that that program, I think, is going to expand quite a bit so that Great. home buyers can look at the, the, um, the home label and see, you know, what are the energy energy efficiency highlights of this particular um, home has it ever been weatherized? Um, you know, uh, how much energy does it use, et cetera, and so forth. Well, I believe yeah. in Zillow. You can see the solar solar potential for the house that you're going to be buying now. So they're you know little by slow, these things are being reported. Yeah. Um, to uh, to chime in real quick on yeah. that, um, kind of tying in the the last couple of conversations um, for plans and, and this, this looking at sites and their efficiencies, we don't really have that when it comes to these EV deployments and, and you know, converting your fossil fuel fleet over to an electric fleet, um, the upgrades that your site facility will need for the scalability of the generation. Um, you know, you you have different people that can look at these architectural plans that can say, well, I think this is what I'm going to need, but what is this actually, what does this audit look like? How do I perform it? How do I make sure that this works properly? Um, this is something that we, we recently started doing and it's, it's going to be a, another, once again, like how complex and exciting this new, 
this new ecosystem is. There's now going to be, you know, this new need for looking at plans and saying, is this facility capable of being a producer of electrons? Is this something that will be able to have vehicle to grid capabilities with utility? Does the site need upgrades? Can this only scale this much? Can't scale this much or, or you know, is, is this safe? Are the tools and equipment that we're putting in place going to be useful um, or, you know, situated in, in, in the right way? Are we storing batteries properly? Um, there's a lot of planning that that's missing all of these different elements. Uh, so it's, things are, are going to get very interesting. There, there's certainly like a, uh, a gap when it comes to funding and grant availability for planning endeavors for this you know, emerging ecosystem that we have. So it's so critical. Great. Yeah, one of the uh, the requirements for the the DOE Net Zero Energy Ready Home Program to to be certified there, you have to have an EV charger as part of your design. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 coming. It's it's a real thing, um, you know. Which which is great. Um, things people need to be thinking about with those chargers, you know, outside of the standard, you know, does my panel have the right space for it? Can I support level two? Is it level three? Um, you know, you have to think about certain safety things. Do I have a class D fire extinguisher? You know, these you have thermal events with these, do I have, um, you know, am I going to need some type of, uh, you know, mitigation system that's different than what I currently have? which we're certainly gonna see in the pipeline in the next three to five years. Um, so having the, the awareness of these are things that I'm going to have, how does this affect not just my location, but the community at hand? Okay, we had another question come up. If you were to begin your field today, where would you start? A school, an employer, or someplace else? I don't know if there's any one answer to that one, but <laughs> we'll take opinions. I, I I was just thinking about that myself, Joanne. Like if like if like if I were just getting started right now in in like in residential building, one thing I would do is yes, I'd learn, I'd get my electrical license, and um, I'd probably uh, the Building Performance Institute (BPI), which people should know about also, and all the training programs that they have. So to have, I mean, I learned building science by building houses, you know, and, and I made, you know, as people have talked about, made some mistakes along the way uh, and, and, and in some cases learned the hard way. So, um, so if, if, if there's a, you know, if there's a field that you're interested in, talk with other people about how they got there and find out what trainings are, are available. Yeah, and I think I think it depends on uh, who you are and what you want to do too. You know, if you're a hands-on learner, then jumping right in is a great option, and uh, especially if you're going to do operations in solar. Um, like Tim said, getting an electrical license, if that's kind of the the track you're going to go, is is such a great great thing to fall back on. Uh, even if the solar industry should disappear, which it's not gonna you can still go do other things with that. Um, if you're going to go into things more like uh, design and engineering, then having that an engineering degree definitely helps. Um, Vermont Tech has a four-year renewable energy program uh, as well, so that's a good option, and it's a very um, broad program that covers a lot of different technologies. So um, yeah, it kind of depends on what you want to do and what your background is. So, so I wanted to chime in off of what Will was just saying and, and Tim um, in terms of, of the how. This is, this is, this is what I'm, one of the things I'm really focused on is, is how do you get to those things? So I would actually say both the employer and the education. Um, so we see in, I think the best example is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and their apprenticeship program, which is now, um, I believe, I, I don't know exactly how the connection works, but I think it's moderated or, or run by VTC now as well. Um, so you would um, become a, a member of the IBEW. Um, it happens there. Normally it's the fall of the year. I think though 
because everyone's so short staffed. Um, I think they have a couple times where new members join. And even if you, it isn't that, um, there is a, um, a, a, an electrical worker status that you can take. So you could be working for them, but you won't be an indentured. <laughs> The, the terminology is still there from the 1800s, um, an indentured uh, apprentice at that point. Um, so it's, I see, can't remember if it's a five or six year pro program, but essentially the way it works is one, if you're, if you're part of the union apprenticeship, you get assigned to a company um, and, or hired essentially um, to a company. And then one day a week uh, for about three or four hours, you go. Um, to your classes while working full time, uh, the wages are starting in the mid teens, uh, well above fifteen dollars an hour. Um, and I think the last because I, I got one student into the program a while ago. I think the electrical worker, the pre the pre apprenticeship is is right around the fifteen dollar mark. It's just sh it's either just shy or just over now. Um, so it's a multi year process. You don't have to do it that way. There are some companies that will put the, you will be an apprentice, but you're not a member of the union. Um, so obviously, depending on how people um, how people would like to approach that. So my answer on that would be a both. Um, and then there are other pro programs and companies that are looking to train on the job and or help pay for school. Or um, there are also kind of again the the engineering. There are two year programs which have you have a bachelor's of arts um, can bridge you over to a master's in engineering uh, rather rapidly. I completely agree with both. Uh, the majority of my college years were working uh, part-time and school part-time. And I think that that's an essential way to go, uh, especially to mitigate college debt. And also if you have trouble finding co-signers or loans in general. Um, and that was mine is I didn't have luck finding loans. Um, so working and education as you can do it is amazing combination. And I think um, a really important thing, the electrical license, big one for sure. And there's there's other similar, similar licensure that you can get in mechanical, electrical and plumbing and piping, which kind of, you know, is mechanical based. Um, but I think when you take a job or uh, go towards a degree, look for accreditation. Um, try to stick in one of them that has some sort of accreditation, because that's one thing that I had missed in my background is that I didn't go for degrees with accreditation. And it has become very difficult now in the future when it was just a matter of different courses that I should have been taking. Um, so just look for accreditations, even if it, you don't have a plan with it yet, it's going to help you in the long run if, if you do want to go that route. Um, so you don't have to fully understand it, just look for them. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to say something completely different. Um, critical thinking skills, communication skills, those are the two foundations for anything that you're going to do. Um, whether that you, you get those by seeking out courses in those um, from, you know, like a personal professional development in, you know, industry, or you do it the old fashioned way by starting a business and having it fail miserably, um, failing upwards, critical thinking skills, communication, that will give you the foundation for understanding how you operate and how you can operate at whatever it is that you discover you want to pursue from there. You know, yeah, absolutely some type of mechanical electrical background is going to further your, your ease of entry into this type of you know, environment. Um, I see Stephen had a question about what qualifications you're looking for when you hire somebody. Um, for us, for what we do, um, we'll contract out people that have specific skills. So it's really catered to, to what the actual project is. Um, but Everybody that we hire, once again, it's, it's based off of not just making sure that they have the, the qualifications for that task, but a lot of it comes down to who that person is. Um, if they're present in the conversation, if they are looking for the success of the project and not necessarily a receipt, um, you know, we, we value our partners, we value who we work with. And, and you know, as you know, when you're when you're engaged in business with somebody or you're employed by somebody or employing somebody else, um, 
you want to have a good relationship with them. So that's that's critical. Um, we do offer training. Um, we're just starting to. Um, I once again, it's it's one of our core values. I think that if you have information, if you have uh, a skill set, right now it's beneficial to share that with others. Um, for most of these projects, you need several different types of people that have several different types of expertise. And um, it's very, very hard to find these specialized unicorn individuals that know everything or have enough foresight in these areas where, where they can put together an, an intelligent conversation. It's, it's very difficult. Um, so I think I answered that. <laughs> also don't, uh... You know, be aware that uh, companies are really hungry for people. They they need people and they're willing to train people. You know, like it, at weatherization, uh, if you knew what a hammer was and a, and knew how to read literally like and read a, a, a tape measure, you know, and, and you show up and and you're and you're willing to align with the mission. Uh, we we train people and we have most of our technical staff were people who started out on the field crew and they and they moved up to the energy auditor position we trained them we got them certified um, and a lot of companies will do that so so just just know that you don't necessarily have to have everything in place um, you know uh, to 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 get involved in these various industries and to get trained there's just so many opportunities right now yeah, I agree with what Tim said. You know, did you watch your dad build a deck when you were a kid? You know, can you read a tape measure and are you going to show up on time? Um, yeah, if, you're that, if you can do those things in the solar industry, you'll get a job as an installer easily. All right. Well, let me see. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and experience. This has been really great as someone. Hang on. <laughs> I got to get pull up building. Uh, considering a midlife career change to rewarding fields that benefits the environment, this has been encouraging. Much of my skill set is unrelated, but I definitely know how to use Excel and have no difficulty showing up. Well, there you go. You got it. There it is. <laughs> you got this. No problem. Uh, and I'll tell you, at, at, at SEI, um, you know, we always look at our students in personas, like where are they coming from and, you know, kind of what's their background. And in almost every single class, we have at least one, if not more, mid-career IT people looking to transition into solar. So, yeah, that's a, a very common thing, and we, we're seeing it more and more. Mm -hmm. And dealerships. Dealerships are secret little locations that they they have high paying jobs. Um, they're great careers. There's upward mobility. Um, you can move from multiple departments to different departments if you show up. Um, once again, that's that's like that's can unbelievable you that this dealership. Is... Can you define sure. dealership for everyone? Thanks. Yeah, a, a dealership would be your Honda store, your Toyota store, your Mercedes-Benz store. Okay, how about in another field? Would it be like the um, distributors? It it could certainly be um, a a fleet distributor. Um, no, I'm not talking cars now. Oh, See, okay. I, I want to get generally broad. I General think that's something broad. we missed was that distributors of equipment is a big job too area that we haven't even touched on. So, yes. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there for mobility and, and knowledge is key and essential. People skills are essential. And, you know, without a good dealership, the supply chain is, has a cog in its wheel. So that's really an important aspect for people to look into as well. Yeah, there's, there's huge, huge delays in the supply chain when it comes to transformers right now. Um, so anybody, anybody that's involved in the, you know, electrical construction maintenance side um, or parts, uh, any type of distributor, parts, any type yeah. of warehouse, yeah. um, all of these areas, trucking, oh my God, uh, everywhere, everywhere needs people. 
showing yeah, up. So just, yeah, I, I wanted to the... make it more less specific to just cars, but it's pretty much across the board, <laughs> important, yeah. lumber, et cetera. All right, well, I think we're almost at the hour and we're not quite, but I, oh, we are over, oh my gosh. Um, sorry about that. I found this phenomenal, fantastic. And, and thank you so much for ex sharing all of your experience of, and knowledge with everyone. And speaking from the heart, it was, it was a, a wonderful session. Thank you so much. So um, keep checking our website, folks. This will be posted if you wanna refer other people to see this. We'll have some resources there that you can click on for some additional information. And you can always reach out to us and ask questions. We're here for you. So thank you so much. And I guess we'll conclude this session and see you next month.